Look, I, I am deeply honoured by, by my selection as a fellow of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. They've got active chapters all over Australia um, and, and, and the, the um, Institute plays a really commendable role in um, bringing to public attention and debating the issues uh, that affect the security and the well-being of Australians and the safety of Australians. So I thank the Institute for allowing me to um, contribute to that debate. While it's a truism to say that there are no new threats upon this earth, no new threats to security and safety, uh, but simply old generic threats dressed up in new clothes, my time in ASIO saw um, a very particular focus on two threats. Um, uh, which have emerged with, with really, in, in, in the scheme of things, with, with quite great speed and intensity, and they've required some pretty tough decision-making and responses in, a, in an environment that's rapidly changing. The first, of course, is the threat of terrorism. Um, uh, terrorism, in this case, by violent Islamist extremists um, across the world uh, and within our midst. And they, they represent a global challenge uh, to peace, security, safety, and all of those sorts of things. And at home, there are particular dimensions, uh, not simply the safety of our citizens and so on, but a challenge to the democratic Australian system, both in our lawmaking and in the way in which, as a community, um, we've tried to um, develop levels of community harmony that um, many other countries have uh, not bothered about or and certainly not achieved. The second issue is um, the issue of cyber security, which I want to talk about today. Now, while it's not so obviously a threat to life and limb, nevertheless, it represents a growing threat to national security, but not only to national security. It represents a threat to the way we live our lives, um, um, the way we go about our lives, or the way we do business. Um, the way we protect our civil liberties, including the right to privacy. Our response to te the terrorist threat is reasonably well formed, <coughs> although we have to continue to be flexible uh, in adapting to the way in which the terrorism threat constantly mutates. Our responses to threats involving cyber security and the use of cyber technology, those responses, frankly, are still in the catch-up phase even as the medium itself is constantly changing. Now, in my lifetime, and as I look around, um, in most of the lifetimes of people here, um, we, we have moved from clunky um, electronic telecommunications, epitomised by Bakelite telef uh, telephones, and for um, younger audiences, I say that they can still occasionally be found in, um, in, in antique shops. Um, we grew up with manual typewriters, and we've, been, we've seen the transition to um, instantaneous universal communications um, and 3D pin printers from card-reading computers the size of a um, large house uh, to wrist-worn devices um, uh, that give instant access both to data and to people. And let's, let's uh, acknowledge uh, right up front that the uh, explosion of the digital world has brought huge benefits to humankind, uh, not just in how we communicate and exchange ideas, but in the way we manage our lives, the way we entertain ourselves, the way we deliver human progress. Digital technology, and what I call its rambunctious offspring, the internet, are conditioning every fibre of our existence now. We use digital technology to defend ourselves militarily. We use it to make our governments uh, and, and our social systems more efficient, not always successfully, as some would argue. We use it to make our economies more productive and our research and development speedier, better focused and more innovative in solving problems. It helps us live better lives, it helps us prolong lives. We use de digital technology to pay our bills and receive our salaries, um, uh, to entertain ourselves, to order our books, our clothes, or whatever. The average Australian now spends a day a week online. Now, 
But it goes beyond that. The, 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 the internet and its telecommunications accessories may have been a product mainly of Western science and Western innovation, but its use and benefits are spreading globally to all countries rich and poor. The in internet has enabled smart, underdeveloped countries to leapfrog over decades of development into brand new industries uh, and rapid social progress. It's accelerated the transmission of ideas and knowledge to half the global population that is actually connected to the internet and through them to the most of the rest of the others. And we now interact digitally almost as much as we interact face to face. We've got a tidal wave of social media available to everyone who can afford what we now simply call a device. We can blog, we can Twitter, we can Google, we can share our innermost musings on Facebook, and I'm terrified that my grandchildren do exactly that. We can contribute to LinkedIn in order to get a better job or something or other. Um, we can wave a card or a cell phone uh, just to pay a bill. Uh, and, and, and while money, of course, still doesn't grow on trees, we've long been able to extract cash from a hole in the wall. And it's not just instant cash. We now have instant access to ideas and information, although I hasten to add not necessarily instant access to wisdom. That takes a lot greater discernment. And we also we have an instant ability to post our own contributions to the world's store of information and knowledge, although, again, I say not necessarily adding to its collective wisdom. I describe this phenomenon as the democratisation of information. And, of course, we should welcome the propagation of innovative views and ideas through the democratising medium of the internet. The expression of opinion soundly based, uncensored by this or that government, or even uncensored by this or that newspaper editor. That's what democracy should be all about. Although sometimes as I look around us at the moment, I su suspect that it's actually also conducive to more than occasional political constipation. This democratisation of information has arrived with such speed and decisiveness that it's actually taken us some time to appreciate what in the United States intelligence community they call the blowback effect. And that is simply that with every great advance come side effects not fully understood at the time and not fully understood until their adverse consequences begun to be felt on a wide scale. Many would actually argue that probably the best current example of the blowback effect is, is in fact global, global warming. Um, so, in embracing the digital revolution, and we have, we have no other choice, uh, we've got to be conscious of and learn to manage the adverse consequences of digital blowback. The vulnerabilities that the advance of information technology and our dependence on it has in fact created. Now, what are some of these vulnerabilities? Well, coming from my background, um, uh, um, well, my more recent background, I'd say that um, from the point of view of um, uh, our national security, our wholesale total dependence on the internet has enhanced two traditional avenues of threat. Espionage and sabotage. Age-old tradition, old threats, but new vectors, i.e. electronic um, uh, digital vectors. And the commitment of nationally sensitive information and communication systems uh, to digital databases and the use of the internet to manage our key infrastructure, such as our telecommunications, our financial and essential services infrastructure, social welfare, transport, taxation systems and so on, have created vulnerabilities that may be exploited by foreign states um, and thus placing an additional burden on our governments to protect our systems, our secrets, our warfighting ca capacities and our general livelihoods uh, against the misuse of this new vector. Now, cyber espionage is now a fact of life internationally. Um, you, you, you can't open the newspapers these days without uh, uncovering some 
um, evidence of it or at least accusation of it. Uh, uh, for example, um, uh, a, a really classic example is, and I use the word reported, uh, Chinese hacking of the personal details, including the security clearance and other personal details, of 25 million US government employees is an example of both the scale but also of the very fine focus that states can now manage in the cyber espionage area. And here in Australia, um, the takeover of the Parliament House Computer Network, uh, which was revealed in 2011, probably began a fair bit earlier than that, or last year's hacking of the Bureau of Meteorology, both uh, attribute to state-based actors, are demonstrations of the sorts of vulnerabilities that must be addressed in Australia. The Australian Cyber Security Centre reported over 14 hundred attacks on mainly government institutions uh, in, in the last year for which figures are available or released in 2014. But those 1400s were the ones that were detected. CERT Australia um, responded to over 11,000 incidents uh, affecting Australian businesses across all major sectors of the Australian economy. Again, this is only the tip of the iceberg. Most attacks go undetected and unreported. And cyber technology has now become an important tool of warfare. 200 years ago, American military doctrine had two domains of warfare, land and sea. 100 years ago, they added air. 60 or 70 years ago, they added space. Five years ago, they added cyberspace. The, the wars of the 21st century will be fought first and foremost in cyberspace, perhaps even before any of the other four domains are seriously engaged. There's another element that um, actually we don't think of uh, in, in relation to state-based espionage and so on, and that is covert cyber influencing. We're reading enough about, in the papers at the moment, about overt influencing of politicians, but covert cyber influencing. It's not simply a question of the sabotage of inf infrastructure and war fighting cap uh, capabilities or, or, um, or, 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 or espionage. Covert attempts to influence political thinking have long been an element uh, of the art of intelligence and the art of diplomacy and so on. I mean, think of the Zimmerman telegram in 2017 when the British Secret Services deliberately uh, intercepted it and released it in order to um, uh, influence public opinion, in this case uh, hastening the entry of the United States into World War I. Social media now gives foreign states, as well as any number of um, non-state private interest groups gives them the ability to influence public opinion by saturating the social cybersphere with carefully targeted misinformation, malicious gossip, innuendo, accusations or whatever, which are then taken up by the mainstream media, often uncritically, and which, um, and I can say this from experience, which have a significant impact, which spook our politicians, often against really objective decision making. Of course, politics was ever thus, uh, but the internet provides a new and potent vehicle for this phenomenon of cyber influencing for political gain. Uh, an example, if the reports are true, and it was Russian intelligence groups that penetrated the Democratic National Committee's email system, uh, uh, a month or so ago, uh, and in the intelligence equivalent of lobbing a hand grenade onto, in, into US politics, deliberately provided those um, emails to WikiLeaks to foist upon a bemused world, then we have a modern example of covert cyber influencing. Uh, presumably uh, to, uh, to disrupt and destabilise um, the, uh, the Clinton campaign. And, uh, and it's interesting that the Trump emails um, um, have not yet been leaked, although whether they've actually been deciphered or not is another matter as well. Um, and, and what the intermediaries, such as WikiLeaks, um, 
What, what to make of them when they can be exploited by clever intelligence services to flood the market with purloined communications to damage, specifically to damage one side or the other or entire countries? So that's, if you like, the nation state angle. But the tools that are available to nation states to conduct espionage, sabotage, covert cyber uh, influencing and so on are also freely available to non-state actors. And in many ways that is an even greater threat because non-state actors are unencumbered by the disciplines of a normal state. So non-state actors, terrorists, can exploit our uh, internet dependence through acts of cyber uh, sabotage. Although it's interesting to note, and I wouldn't want to say this too publicly because we might be just wishing a, something awful upon us, it's interesting to note that so far Islamic terrorism has not made, uh, has made more use of the internet for recruitment and proselytization and propaganda purposes than it has for cyber espionage and sabotage. Um, other, other threats from both state and non-state actors here, um, the threat to intellectual property, uh, uh, property the, the ability to steal intellectual property um, um, stored in databases anywhere around the world uh, and to, uh, to profit from that. It's a major concern. Organised crime, serious organised crime around the world is simply galloping ahead in the exploitation of cyber systems containing commercial or personal information, including credit cards and bank accounts and so on for criminal gain. The, the global cost of cyber crime last year was estimated to be $400 billion. And it is expected to rise in the next three to four years to over $2 trillion. Uh, and, and so and every um, company and every individual can be a target uh, for um, highly sophisticated crime using um, cyber access. Then, of course, you know, we've got this army of hackers and spammers and fishers and all those sort of people trying to take over our personal computers, our, 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 our medical doctor's computers, our accountant's computers or whatever, for a whole range of, of, of malicious purposes. A current lucrative form of attack, of cybercrime, is, is ransomware, whereby someone gets takes advantage of our dependence on, on digital technology to hold our personal data hostage and inaccessible uh, until we pay a ransom to release it. Sometimes, of course, the, 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 the hacking and the disruption is, is a form of political protest um, or merely um, there's a whole group of people out there who are what I call hacker joyriders. It's just the sheer beauty of being able to hack into things and the exquisite uh, delicacy of it all um, is, is, is very attractive. Um, alternatively, there are numerous websites available that will teach you how to ma um, uh, mount a DDoS attack. A DDoS attack is basically distributed denial of service whereby you so overload um, a website or a system that it ceases to function. Um, and, um, and if you don't want to do it yourself, you can now actually get onto the internet and hire someone to do it for you. Um, and so, and, 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 and you know, DDoS can be done by state actors and non-state actors. Um, in, um, I think it was 2007, Russia literally turned Estonia off by mounting this huge denial of service attack which brought all their computer systems and their financial systems to a halt for three or four days. Um, and that was because I think they were peaked over the location or relocation of a war statue or something or other. Um, it can be used for, this sort of thing can be used um, um, uh, as, a, as a form of protest. In this case, it was a state-based protest. Um, but it can also, as I say, be used as a, um, a weapon, and I quote Russia again. Um, uh, I would like to tell the story of poor old Boris sitting there um, in the western Ukraine in his um, electricity grid office 
packing up to go home. It's late December, it's freezing cold outside. He's putting on his gloves and he looks at his screen, about to turn his screen off, and he notices the cursor running all over the screen. He, he's not got his hand anywhere near his mouse. Um, and, uh, and he watches, helpless, as the cursor opens up 11 electricity substations and turns them off. And turned off um, electricity for 230,000 freezing Ukrainians uh, in December of last year. That's the sort of thing that can happen. There's one final thing that, um, that I need to mention in relation to the, the notion of the threat. And it, so I've said it's not state, uh, not only state based, and it's non state actors as well. Um, but there's another element of threat, and that is what I call the trusted insider. Um, perhaps the the most common vulnerability in the cyber technology domain lies not just with the technology, but with the people who use it. Now, the biggest threat to cyber security is, in fact, poor systems, poor computer hygiene, lack of security awareness, allowing systems to be exploited for malicious purposes. A particular concern is the trusted insider with access to its systems and its data. Employees with deliberate malicious intent may perpetrate security breaches. Classic example, Edmund Snowden. But far more frequently, insiders with no malicious intent can let intruders uh, have access to their system by accident, by innocent uh, neglect, or by ignoring security procedures. Or frankly, just losing their computer and leaving it on a bus. So that's the sort of world we're now living in. How do we protect ourselves against it? Um, there are protections against cyber attack. For small businesses and individuals, you can, if you adopt four basic and relatively simple procedures, such as making sure you change your passwords, making sure you know who's got access to your system, um, and you control that access, making sure that you update, patching is the word, um, um, update your, your software with all the proprietary updates that seem to spend take hours of my computer's time, um, and so on. Um, those sorts of things, um, whitelisting, which is a bit more complicated, that enables you to prevent, you tell your computer to not to change any programs without um, um, going through a whole series of um, procedures um, and, and so on. Those, those, that will enable you to um, um, protect yourself against about 85% of current common computer attacks. And that's as, almost, I think, as, as good as it's going to get. For larger companies and government institutions, um, we, we, we need to rely on cyber security experts um, developing solutions that have moved beyond just building firewalls against things coming in, because um, you can get around those, um, into, into, into whole new realms of predictive and intuitive digital analysis uh, that provides deeper layers of security. And there are now major consulting companies falling over themselves to promote this sort of one-stop cyber security management package. But it's always a moving target. Um, the cyber attacker has always managed to keep at least a step ahead of the cyber defender. And so, I don't, I, I, while I've used the word cyber security right through this, what we actually aim for is not absolute cyber security, because we probably won't ever get there, but, um, but to develop the concept of cyber resilience, to develop a whole holistic approach um, be, be it, whether it be your personal computer system, your um, the small business computer system, or your great big um, government departmental computer system um, that will enable you more effectively to manage risks and to be able to respond appropriately um, when, um, when your defences are, are down. So there we are. The benefits of a cyberspace for an economic and social development are undeniable. <laughs> We're not going back to Bakelite telephones, paper bank checks, and handrolic ways of um, managing essential systems. Um, but we're there, we, we have to learn to recognise and deal with the vulnerabilities that this dependence 
um, has, has um, uh, created. And my argument is that this requires a national response. A national response that invariably is going to involve partnerships between industry and government. Um, in my experience, too, in recent years, um, I, I found that left to its own devices, the easy way for industry, for example, is simply to rush off, usually to the United States or elsewhere, to buy cyber security off the shelf uh, and, and without having to incur the costs of research and development and so on, the risks of research and development, and without, but also without fostering an indigenous cyber security capability. <coughs> Now, over the past few years, and I was in my previous jobs, I've been involved in a lot of this, um, frustratingly so at times, um, governments have sought to address the problem. They've created the computer emergency response teams um, designed to provide cyber security support to industry. They've um, given the Department of Defence um, uh, funding to, to develop uh, on behalf of government stronger um, uh, cyber resilience. Uh, they brought together into one place um, the Defence Intelligence uh, Agency, the um, 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 Signals Direct Directorate, uh, ASIO, AFP, uh, CERT Australia itself, the Australian Crime Commission, um, into, into a, um, what's now called the Australian Cyber Security Centre, with a brief not simply to protect um, government IT uh, uh, and so on, but to reach out to industry as well. But I have to say that up until now, most of the, uh, the cyber work done by government was underfunded and dependent on cross-agency cooperation that's taken a while to develop. It's taken time, too, for understanding of the threat to government information from cyber attacks to permeate outside the intelligence and defence communities into the broader, incredibly data-rich uh, and data-sensitive bureaucracy, just as it has t taken an equally long time for the threat of cyber attack to, um, to make its way into Australian boardrooms uh, and onto company risk registers. And indeed, only in the last year um, have the threads been drawn together, I think, into a more coherent national cyber security strategy, um, of which there are numerous elements. But the, the government has nominated cyber security as one of the themes for industry-driven um, government-sponsored research in its uh, CRC, Co uh, Cooperative Research Centres program. The Defence White Paper, um, after um, a, a tentative discussions in the past has now come out much more strongly in recognising um, the need for increased investment in uh, intelligence, cyber and related facilities, up to 200 new, uh, 1,200 new positions, I think, and three to $400 million worth of expenditure um, over the next decade. And we have to acknowledge that this will, no doubt, uh, from a defence point of view, involve both offensive and defensive um, cyber capabilities. Then the government announced, the Prime Minister announced the National Innovation and Science Agenda um, uh, in, uh, in November last year, uh, and they're creating uh, cyber security growth centres to try to get, um, um, to create a, uh, a cyber security industry uh, here in Australia. And finally, they pulled it all together into a sort of a single coherent whole uh, in the government's uh, cyber security strategy, which was released uh, in April this year. So governments are beginning to, uh, um, are more than beginning, um, they, are, they are taking this uh, much, much more seriously. Um, and they've indeed, uh, in, in addition, they've actually appointed a fellow called Alistair McGibbon as the first special advisor to the Prime Minister on cyber security, which is a welcome um, recognition of the importance of this to our, our protection uh, and to our economic development. I think he's going to have his work cut out for him. One further thing that we do need to, um, particularly with this group, is, is to consider is the whole notion of cyber security as a global issue. Cyber attacks are transnational in nature, usually, and international cooperate, cooperation to fight cyber crime is really uh, essential. And indeed, the government's new um, cyber security strategy includes uh, the intention to appoint an ambassador for cyber affairs, um, which 
gives rise to all sorts of possible interpretations, um, uh, to develop our, our international cyber engagement. And there's been work done right back in the early eight, uh, in the in the 90s, um, uh, within the co um, context of the International Telecommunications Union. Um, we had the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, so people were starting internationally to to look at that. More recently, UN sponsored efforts to apply international law to the conduct um, of states in cyberspace including cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property, property, have begun, have begun, I have to say, the process of identifying the problem. There is still a very long way to go. And all of us remember, some of us in this room particularly remember just how long it took to develop the international law of the sea uh, and to negotiate and to, and to have it um, um, established, um, albeit not yet in the South China Sea. Um, and. And the notion of establishing international norms for state-based behaviour in cyberspace can be expected to be a prolonged affair. Because, first, in the first place, very few countries, and I, uh, and I wouldn't advocate it myself, given my background, uh, are willing to refrain from using uh, cyberspace for espionage or for, or for war fighting. And in addition, there's a significant difference between uh, the countries of the world, particularly the West, uh, and, um, and then countries like Russia and China uh, and the Third World, a significant difference over the nature and extent that, um, of international regulation uh, of the Internet and the cyber world where that would impact upon the uh, nature and extent of state control uh, or, or censorship uh, of the Internet. And the final point that I think was going to prolong this particular um, agony for uh, in the international sphere is simply the anarchic nature of the of the internet. It's going to make regional regulation difficult, uh, but not necessarily impossible over time. So there we are. Um, let me just sort of conclude by saying, uh, leaving you with one thought from a fellow called Rod Beckstrom, who put this out in 2010. And um, he's, he's most noted for um, trying to develop a, an algorithm to tell you what the value of the internet is. Uh, and it's somewhere a bit more than 42. Um, uh, uh, he, but he came up with um, uh, this, this, this thing that really sticks in my mind, and it should stick in yours. And it's basically three points. Easy steps in logic. Except the first fact. If it's connected to the internet, it's hackable. Everything now is connected to the internet. Therefore, everything is hackable. This is a truly wicked problem. So to sum up the points, we depend on cyber technology. This dependence is going to increase. Government and industry in Australia have made a very late start on addressing the blowback effects of that technology and, the, the, and its vulnerabilities. At the same time, as the structure of our economy changes, we've got to develop national capabilities in the IT area, uh, in the new IT-dominated global economy, uh, and cybersecurity has to play an important part of that. That impacts on our education programs, on our support for research and development, um, and so on. I think the government has ticked most of the right boxes uh, in terms of vision and methodology for addressing this wicked problem, but um, we have to implement this strategy and we have to Im implement it successfully uh, and we have to make up for lost ground. And ultimately, my final point is ultimately governments won't do this alone. It really does depend on the ability of government business and the everyday internet user to develop our national resilience against a problem that is simply going to grow more and more over the next decade. Thank you very much.